Al, could you tell me a little bit about your family and where you grew up? Yeah. Uh, I was um, born and raised in Verona, Pennsylvania, which is up the river here. It was with five children, the four boys and one girl. And my mom and dad came from Naples, Italy, to this great country of ours. And, uh, of course, my dad always made wine all the time. He never drank water. He said, I'll rest your pipes. So uh, during, during the flood, we always used to get flooded out. And he had to put wine barrels downstairs. And he told us four kids, come on with me. We were down house. He wasn't worried about the house going to be flooded, which it did. He, we had to nail them down to the ceiling. Don't ruin the wine. The heck with the house, but I, don't, I want to save the wine. So that's what he did. Did you speak Italian growing up? In oh, yes. That's all the first language I learned because we were all amongst Italians down there, you know, along the railroad tracks, and uh, we always spoke Italian to each other. Uh, what did your dad do for a living? Well, my dad, of course, I was up during the Depression. He was working. He was laid off for quite a while until the war broke out, you know. But uh, he, when he came to this country, he fell off a building in New York, and he his busted his leg, and he left him a cripple, you know. So, uh, so when the war broke out, then he got a job, luckily, and because nobody was working then. So it was a it was a hard upbringing. It was tough during the depression. Oh God, yes, it was it was tough. But I never remember going to bed hungry, because my mother, we had two big gardens. My mother always canned, put everything in a can, and uh, we never went to bed hungry. I don't ever remember it. But we had nothing. Ice cream was five cents a cone. Movies was five cents. I didn't even didn't even have that to go to the movies. But we were happy. We had a good life. Yeah. So, so you and your brothers, I, I suppose, had to drop out of school early to get go to work. No, I quit school because I was. They kept me back for uh, several years. I was sixteenth and eighth grade, and when when the kids thought that I was the teacher, I said, "Well, it's time for me to leave." <laughs> That's when I quit. So. And what did you do when you quit? I went to work mixing uh, uh, plaster for houses, and then finally I got a, a job with a water company. I was there for 39 years, and and that, that, that then my brothers started to work, too. Were you working at the water company when Pearl Harbor happened? Yes. No, no, no. Not yet. No, not in 41. I went in 43, 44, oh, okay. 43. Could you, do you remember December 7th, 1941? Do you remember that day? Oh, oh, vividly. Not too good, but just vividly. What do you remember from that day? I really don't remember what it was. Oh, okay. You, you don't remember what you were doing when no, you heard no, the news? No. Okay. How, no. No, I, did, I was working for the water company. I was a flagman on the road. I was making 35 cents an hour. And uh, then and that's when I was drafted. After. So when were you drafted? 1943. Yeah. How old were you when you were drafted? I just turned 18. And uh, I got my notice to go down for my physical and stuff. So that was it. And you knew it was coming, I guess, huh? Oh, yeah, because I had the, out of the, out of the four brothers, three of us was only a, a year apart. Now, I, I was the third. My brother was the first. My other brother was the second. He was in the 28th Infantry Division of Pennsylvania. He was in the Battle of the Bulge, got wounded twice. But he since uh, passed away here about eight, ten years ago. So when you got your draft notice, you got your physical? Yeah, they sent me to... Uh, 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 Mer uh, in Don Maryland, Gab uh, forget what they call Fort it. Fort Meade? N no, it was a proving ground down there in Maryland. Aberdeen. Uh, Aberdeen, that's the one. And they interviewed us, and uh, <clears throat> they asked me what part of the service you want. I said, well, I'll take the Marines. He said, no. I said, well, then I'll take the Navy. He said, no. I said, then why you ask me where? He said, I'm putting you in the infantry. I said, what you ask me for? He said, because you didn't have a high school diploma. I didn't graduate high school, so he put me in the Army. Yeah. 
Then they shipped me down to uh, Mississippi, Hattiesburg, Mississippi, and uh, uh, City in the 69th Division down there. And uh, then from there. What was basic training like? Well, it was it was tough, but it it, it was it was good for you though. You know, we used to go on 25 mile hikes, you know, and then back. It would stay for the night and then come back. But I didn't mind it. You know, it, they didn't care what happened. You, all your muscles were sore and everything, but they didn't care, and you had to work through it. So what are you gonna do? And then what did you do after basic training? Where did they send you? Well, after basic training, first they go on it. They send us a, a, a couple of weeks uh, home for, and then come back. So when we got back, they got us all together and he says, um, we got a list here. We're going overseas, you know. So they go alphabetical order. So they come to my name and passed it up. So they said, we got another... Uh, list here. It's called uh, supernumerary. Well, I thought it was a disease. I don't know what it was. And pass, uh, the, so they passed me up on the first one is going to go to sea overseas. And the second one, I was on that super list. So I said, what the heck is this? So I went to the officer and I said, what is this about? He says, uh, if nobody can't go on the first list, then we'll pick somebody from the second one. And I said, you still don't have a chance of getting picked. He said, yeah. I said, no, no, no. I said, I want to go with my friends that I've been with and trained with. That's, he said, I can't do nothing. So I said, oh, oh I, was, I was really down and out. So I went to my company command, and I told him that story. And he tells me the same thing. He says, I, this come from headquarters. I can't change nothing. I'm sorry. The so next day, the officer comes up to me and says, the phase, yeah, I don't know what you did, but you're on the list to go. Oh, I was happy then. That was good. Then from there. Can you explain why did you want to go overseas? You'd think that you'd want to not go overseas. No, I wanted to go. Uh, uh, a terrible. I wanted to go with my buddy that I trained with, you know. That's, that's, that's why. And I was really down and out when they passed me out. Now, why they did, I don't know. You know, you, you talked, uh, or in your memoir, and you've talked to me about before, about um, the Army was rough. Even before you went overseas, you kind of had a rough time. The food was never good. There was never enough of it. That well, Nothing ever bothered me too much, really. I just took it with a grain of salt. You called me, I went, and here I am, and I'll do what you tell me, and I did. And that, that's our company. But it was, it was tough because we had uh, one fellow who was a smart aleck. And we had an American Indian. He was a staff sergeant. He took him behind the latrine in the shed and beat the hell out of him. <laughs> he straightened out fast. You, they didn't take no baloney then. They didn't call their senator or whoever up. You took what you got. You deserved it. That's it. Outside of that, I wasn't. I, I didn't mind the army. I really didn't because I was going to sign up to go to the South Pacific when I come back. Then they, they said to me, no, he says, you're going to get out on the point system soon, you know. So I said, okay, so that's when I come home then. So uh, did you, were you put into the 36th Division before you went overseas or after? Okay. After. Um, tell me about the trip going over. What was that like? Well, first they took us down to the uh, Fort New, um, sorry, Virginia, uh, at the sea, and they had a big... Now, we, they never tell you where you're going. I think they have a school for officers to lie because they're good at it. They don't tell you nothing. So we, we, they took us down to the shore, and they had these uh, uh, ships they, that the merchant marines used. They didn't use them for, just use them for transportation. And they, um, they put, I forget how many of us on a Liberty ship, you know, nose to nose. And uh, we didn't know where we was going. We, some of the guys that worked on it, we asked them, you know, where are we going? He says, I don't know. The only thing I know, we're going out to sea. We're going to dock out there. And they're going to, in the morning, we're going to leave because they're going to be a, a, a 500 ships that's going to gather to go with us. So anyhow, we waited till morning, looked at all of that. All you seen was a, a sea of ships. Uh, every, Destroyers, uh, uh, everything, uh, all kinds of as you want. 
So finally we took off and we hit a storm. I was almost washed overboard. Good thing I grabbed onto a rope, you know. Well, anyhow, for 30 days, they starved us. We got a cracker about that big and something to drink, and that's all we got That I said, well, maybe tonight we'll get something. They gave us nothing. So we was on the sea for 30 days, and to the day we spotted land after 30 days. So we docked in Oran, Africa, and they took us to the, uh, they had big tents there. There was 16 or 18 of us to a tent. And they said, when you go to bed tonight, go to bed with your rifle, because the Ar Arabs was coming in every time and steal whatever you had. So then uh, after that, we got a chance to go into Casablanca for on leave. Then from Casablanca, they took us down to the railroad stores and they had all these cattle cars lined up. So we loaded on them, it was 80 to a car. And we didn't know where we were going to either. But 80 uh, men to a car? Eight, sorry, to no. one cattle car, 80 guys. I forget how many cars were there. But uh, they loaded, you couldn't sit down. You had to stand up. So it took us three days and nights. Finally, we got to Algiers. And when we got to Algiers, everybody got, uh, they started us there too. Everybody got dysentery. You see everybody running for the latrine, and when they stopped, you said, oh, he didn't make it. <laughs> and then uh, they called us out, and they said, um, somebody stole a truckload of mattress covers, truck and all. And because uh, they sold the uh, mattress covers for $20, because the Arabs, they all wore these thing, long thing. They cut three holes in them, and they wear them, and they sold them for $20 a piece. Never did find out who stole the truck and all. You know. Well, then uh, finally they took us down and uh, loaded us up on a British uh, transport ship. Oh, my God, what a bucket of bolts. I thought it was a Merrimack from the Civil War. Well, anyhow, we loaded at night and we crossed the Mediterranean. We spotted land. We landed at Naples, Italy. And I said, well, you know, I said, this is where my mother and father departed from that port to get to the great United States. And then I remembered that we had relatives in the same town my mother was still there. My father had a, had a brother and a sister there, and my mother had two brothers and a sister in the town where my mom and dad was born. But they didn't know each other when they lived there. They didn't meet each other till they were over here. So then they took us to the racetrack, Mussolini Rosa track, you know, and pitched our pup tents and uh, finally come for roll call for eating. <coughs> so we lined up, got our uh, finest china, which is tin cans, you know. <laughs> so they had some kind of stew that day. Then I'm tasting this piece of meat in this, and then it was red, it was sweet, and it, it was, I don't know, it was a uh, good day. So I asked one of the guys, I said, well, what kind of meat is this? The guy says, this is horse meat. I said, what the hell are you talking about, horse meat? You see any horses here? I said, I've seen two of them, you know. <laughs> but to this day, so I started back when we were done. I was going at a pretty good trot, too, you know. <laughs> but still, I, did, I didn't believe that it was a horse. It could have been. I don't know. Then we went back to our tents. This one, he come back with the patches. He says, sew these on your uh, jackets and your shirt. You are now in the 36th Infantry Division under the command of General Mark Clark's 5th Army in Italy. And that's the one when I was in Italy. So at night, we shipped out at night because you, you couldn't go during the day. Finally, we got to the mountain, the bottom of the mountain there. We knew it was at the front there because we could hear the <coughs> shelling. Uh, and, uh, what mountain was it? She knows. Valerie knows. Yeah. Mount Trachia? Mount, Mount what? Trachia. Trachia, I guess. I don't, I don't know. Okay. I didn't pay no attention to me. Well, anyhow, while we were there waiting for the 36th Division to come in for, to, to, for us to join them, so we... Uh, me and two other guys, we started to climb the mountain. So finally, 
come daylight, there was a one officer come. He said, who was the three guys that climbed that mountain up there? And I said to him, I said, something wrong here. There, I had an old sergeant back in the States. He told Sergeant Feathercheck, he said, listen, soldier. He said, never volunteer for anything unless you know exactly what it is. So I didn't. I turned around, you know, hiding. They picked the two guys. There was one more. He said, that was me. And I'm laying there. I didn't say a word. Uh, and so after they took him away and left, and I said uh, to the guy, I said, where are these guys going? He said, they're going to go make mule skinners out of them. Now, those mules used to take everything up the top of the mountains, sure-footed, you know. <laughs> that's what they're going to do with them. And that's what they would have done with me. Well, hang on, I'm going to be no mule skinner. So that was just finally the 36th come in. We joined them, and then we climbed on top of the mountain. And after we were on top of the mountain, there we pitched our pup tent. And uh, it was um, got up in the morning. It was a couple of inches of snow. It had snowed. And um, I got up, and it was January the 14th. That's the day I turned 19 years of age, that day. But I never told anybody because I, I, they, my, they probably wanted to take me out to some fancy restaurant or something. So, but I never said any. That's I turned 19. <coughs> Finally, the mail call come. The mailman called, and then you go to him, and he gives you the watches. So the lieutenant tells the mailman, he says, uh, you going back down to base camp? He said, yes, sir. He says, uh, I want you to tell the cook to bring some donuts and hot chocolate up here for the men. He says, okay. So he goes down. Next day, he comes up again, mail call. So the officer says, did you tell the cook? You know, he said, I did. But he said, it's too dangerous to come up here. He said, oh, he did. He said, yeah, you go back down. He said, yeah, you go down, you tell the cook. Coffee and donuts are you up here. Man, pretty soon you see the mules coming up here with the donuts and the, and the coffee, you know. So then uh, they put, put the guards out because you can overlook the river. And on top of the mountain, you see the, the Monte Cassino. So they... Me and another, it was his turn, my our turn, to go. He said, when you go over that, we were in the woods side. The other side is where there was big stones and everything. When you go there, pick your spot, crouch down, don't move. If you move, they're going to be throwing some shells in here. So that's what we did. But there was a captain with us, for the two of us. I said, what the heck is he doing here? Anyhow. He looks down at me and he says, uh, soldier, go down there and get the stove. They had little stoves with the heat, canned heat that they used to, if you want to melt a chocolate bar or something like that. He says, soldier, go down there and get that burner down there. And we'll have some hot chocolate. I said, Captain, if you want hot chocolate, you go down yourself and get it. It hit me then. I said, well, I'm in big trouble. I disobeyed an order from a captain there. I was worried. So the shift was over, and I went to captain talking to the guys. So one of the guys uh, said, listen, ain't nothing going to happen. I said, what are you talking about? I said, I just, they just told a captain to off, you know. You get that little book that they gave you. It was like a Bible. And I said, well, yeah, read it. And in there it says, no officer or non-commissioned officer should tell you to do anything that they wouldn't do themselves. <coughs> so he was right. He never bothered me. No, nothing ever happened. Well, in the meantime, when we was up there, they were shelling. A few shells come in and hit. A bunch of guys were talking. And it hit in between a guy. One guy got hit in the heart. He went down. And he looks up at everybody. He says, uh, please help me. You know. And what could they do? They says, and he died. He passed on. He passed on. Well, then finally they got us. Was that the first man you saw killed? Yes, first one. Yeah. That must have had an impact on oh, you. Oh, I never seen anything like that before. But that, but that was nothing but what came later. Uh, so uh, when they called us all, and there was a 
second, uh, first lieutenant, he had a two bars. He, uh, God, he says, I'm your new company commander. <laughs> he took the place of the captain. What, what happened to the captain? I don't know. He says, uh, most of you guys will be killed before I even learn your name. I said, I said, you know, he shouldn't have said that. But I'm going to tell you something. The man was right. So he's making his tours. And he comes to me and my buddy, and he says, you know, you guys look so much alike, I can't tell you two apart. Uh, well, everybody looks like something, you know. So he's continuing to make his rounds. Then a few days later, he called us together again, and they said, we're going to make a, an attack on Monte Cassino. We're going to cross the Rapido River, go up the field, and to the mountain. And I said, well, okay. So it come, he said, well, now we're going to put smoke pots out. You ain't going to be able to see nothing. He says, and what you do, you grab the high pack of the fella in front of you and on the side of you, because you'll get lost. We don't want nobody to get lucky, because you couldn't see nothing. So we did. We started down, down the mountain. We got down, and you can feel you're going to level spot. Oh, my God. They start lobbing shells in there. That it blew away the smoke uh, there, and it was like the daylight. And I look, and I see piles of body, arms gone, legs, uh, three or four piles, and I see another one. Within seconds, they were coming in. These, uh, I said, I can't. I don't want to see no more. So... I hit the ground, then finally I said, I got to get out of here. So I got up and headed straight. I hit the river. And they had pontoon, nut pont, they had the bri bridges are tied on each end. And you could see the guys crossing. They were falling off of the bridge and because the, the river was, wasn't wide. <laughs> but it was swift and high because of the mountain, the snow was melting. And you see guys falling off of the bridge, and how the heck are they ever going to come up with all that equipment they have on them? I said, well, i got to do something. So I looked upstream, and I heard there was a bridge there. So I run through the bridge, and I rushed across and hit the bank. But that time, when I hit the bank, it wasn't too long after I had retreat, go back up to the mountains. So I looked, the bridge was still there, so I went across, up the mountain. When I got on top of the mountain, I was tired. I was cold and hungry. I sat down with my head to my knees and I couldn't believe what I saw. I just couldn't believe it. Oh my God. So the uh, company, the commander come again, he said, put some dry socks on get some rest of something to eat. We're going back again tonight. I says, oh my God, I said, I won't be back. I said, I won't be back. I couldn't be so lucky. We were lucky the first time. I, I won't, that's all I kept saying, I won't be back, I, I won't come back. So then we got us all together again. And uh, <clears throat> they told us, well, this time we're not putting the pots out. I says, good, whoever the idiot was that that, that should have been shot. And they says, we're, we're going to spread this time, not in bunch like bananas. So we starts back down again, and we hit, we got to the spot where hell broke loose. Nothing happened, not a shot was fired. I said, oh, this is unusual. So when we got to the river, instead of the footbridges, they had rubber pontoon boats. <laughs> You just get in them. If they break loose or whatever, you're just going to go, go downstream anyhow, you know. Nothing can happen. And then me and a lieutenant and my buddy, he's a lookalike, got in there and went across. We hit the bank. And uh, the lieutenant looks down at me. He says, you know, I'm going to start a special unit, and I want you to come with me. I said, yeah, yeah, who do I got, you know, just, <laughs> I don't know what kind of, but it never happened. Anyhow, we're looking across the field. There used to be all trees, 
they cut them down so they could see us coming, the Germans, because you could look up and up in the hill at the Monte Cena there. And so uh, then the lieutenant looks down at me, he says, so he says, let's go. So, okay, we got up, the three of us, because the rest of them was, there were so many to cross. You're going to put so many at a time. So we started across the field. Nothing there, you know. And walking, well, finally I looked back. I didn't see nobody because we were about 60, 70 feet ahead of the main unit. So I said, well, I said, they must have pulled out from the casino, the chairman, you know. And I'm walking, all of a sudden, all hell broke loose again. Everything was coming in, all small fires and mortars and everything. A shell hit to my left between me, a lookalike, and the lieutenant. And it, it blew me about three feet into a ditch with water. I was stunned, not for long, for seconds I was stunned. I said, what the hell am I at, you know? So finally I felt, felt pain back here and in my back. And uh, I put my hand back there and my pants were torn, my backpack was gone. I put my hand back there and I stuck my finger into a hole and I was bleeding. And I felt the pain in my back, I did the same thing, I was bleeding. I, I looked over to my buddy, he was gone. His whole back, his backpack was torn apart. He was gone, I could tell that. He was not. Finally, the lieutenant hauled over and says, uh, you guys are all right. I says, Lieutenant, I'm hitting two places. I think my buddy's gone. He says, you get back across the river, get some help, tells me. I say, yeah, I'll call a taxi, I say, I get back. How the hell am I gonna get back? It is all the small iron fire, everything coming in, you know. So I had to make a decision. I said, either stay here, bleed to death and freeze it or whatever, or I'll, if I'm here in the morning, the Germans are gonna get me. Or I gotta try to get back. So I said, I'm gonna try to get back. Worst thing I ever did. No, it was the best thing. <laughs> and uh, I struggled to get up, you know, and I'm hobbling back towards the river to get back there. So as I was going, I could feel the small fire to come through my legs and I didn't get hit, like, oh my God. So when I got within 10 feet of the river, nobody was there because we were so far ahead, they had more time to go back and get off of the battlefield. Suddenly a, a shell hit to my left and I seen a, a, a fella bounce. Instead of me going across the river to get some help, I went over to him. And I looked at him and uh, I said to myself, guess who it was? It was Lieutenant Spike. The one that said most of you guys will be killed before I know your name. He was out of it. He wasn't dead. I'm looking, I'm wondering, I gotta get him out of here, he's gonna die. I'm looking around and everybody was gone already across the river because they were so far behind us. So then uh, I seen some guys and I hollered over to them. I said, hey, come here. It's Lieutenant Spike. If we don't get him out of here, he's gonna die. So they come up, was two of them. We took him down to the river, put him in the pontoon rubber boat, went across. Now, we, I didn't know where the aid station was, but we started downstream, you know, as we going down there, and, oh man, I was aching. The blood was coming down and going into my shoe and everything, so finally, we run into some guys. I say, do you know where the first aid station is? He says, yeah, go down to this point here, then turn left, you'll see the light, you'll see it's right there. So that's what we did. When I got there, the whole place was loaded with Wounded uh, soldiers, oh my God, they're laying all over the place. So I seen the uh, one of the watch calls come out and I called for him. I said, listen, the uh, lieutenant is hurt bad. He needs help. He looks at him. <laughs> he says, yeah. He said, they're busy inside too. He said, but we'll take him because I can see he needs it. How are you? I said, well, I'm hit two places, but I, I can stay, you know. 
He said, I'll be back for you. I won't forget. So he goes in. Minutes come back. He come. They come back with a stretcher. <laughs> Strew me on. They took me inside. And my God, the doctors and nurses, they deserve the credit. What they did, and they'd patch him up, and the nurses would go and banjo, whatever it is. The next thing I woke up <coughs> in a hospital, and uh, it was, they had the, the nuns were the, were the uh, nurses there, you know. They gave me a pill, and I ended up in Naples Hospital. I forget how long I was there. When I was released to go back to my outfit, I, I don't recognize many guys. Most, most of them was either killed or wounded and couldn't come back. And it wasn't too long. Uh, too, out of my company, my company, six of us come back. Only six of us alive. The rest were all gone. So then finally they took us down to the Mediterranean Sea and they loaded us on a uh, British transport. A uh, rickety old ship, yeah. And at night, so we crossed the Mediterranean. That's when we, I told you, we hit Naples, Italy. And then, and then uh, from there, after after that, they boarded us on an LST. They only had two of them over there. One could have been the one that was Pittsburgh. I don't remember the name. <coughs> so they loaded us on the one up there, and we landed at. Anzio, and there was uh, n nothing was going on, no fire, no nothing, for the simple reason this was the best surprise attack that they had made because they had to pull the Panzer divisions from Monte Cassino to come over and block our way because we were only 20 miles from Rome. And uh, they come over, and uh, we were, then they made a mistake. We got to the mountain, they stopped, we stopped. We should have kept going to the mountain. We'd have had the high ground. By that time, the Panzer Division came from Monte Cassino and blocked our way. We couldn't, we couldn't move because on the other side of the mountain, it was Rome, 20 miles. Hey, Al, I just, you, you mentioned uh, being on the LST and landing at Anzio. Uh, recently, your daughter, Valerie, discovered a photo that's uh, yeah, look <laughs> you on a landing craft, and it, it's almost certainly you, don't you think, in the back? It looks like me. It looks like me, so I could be. I don't know. But it looks exactly like me with a mustache and with my face. face yeah. And that is the kind of landing craft that you landed on Anzio in, correct? LST. Okay. Landing ship tank, yeah. Right. There was only two of them in, in, in there because after the war, they land leased them to Greece. But I don't know that what was the number right. of, of it. There was, I don't remember that, so I can't say for sure. And uh, from there, we got another beaten man. Dan. Yeah, well, what was Anzio like? What do you mean? In what way? Yeah, what, where did you did you did you spend your days in a foxhole or what was? We we spent the, when we hit the mountain and and got a lot of flack from the Germans coming from the from Monte Cassino. Yeah, we dug up. There was two of us in a foxhole, and and then that's when they. There was one of our tanks come in. Where did they go? Right next to me, where we had the foxhole. And they had the 37s shooting at this tank. And they all I said, get this tank out of here, because that's where they're aiming for. And so then I, I said, I got to get out of here. So I got up, went back, and went down, went down. And man, everything was coming. There were trees that were going, and everything hit right next to me. I'm, and uh, after it was over, there was lucky there was a medic there. He picked me up. What had happened to you? I got. I figured that's where I got shell shocked, or uh, I still got post traumatic stress till today. You know, not real bad, but uh, I had. He took me to the farmhouse, and they were all laying outside there, too wounded. One, his belly was slit here. His stomach was sticking out. They tried to push it back in. They couldn't get it in. You know. So then the next thing I knew, uh, I was behind the lines and I was, they gave me a pill, put me out. The doctor examined me and he says, uh, he says, son, I'm not sending you back to your outfit. I'm sending you home. And that's when I came home then from, 
from Italy. Do you think you had been thrown up in the air or something like that? I mean, you were. it was the shelling at Anzio, just a long time shelling, just enduring that pounding that well, did it? Well, it, it didn't lift me off of the ground, but it, it shook me bad. You could feel this, the ground shaking and everything, you know, everything come in there. And they had a big gun mounted on the, the flat cars, two flat cars. That thing had a, a shot a shell as big as a, a small car. You could hear it coming. When it hit, you could send the block layers in there to put, put a foundation. That's how big of a hole. That's a, you could see the shell, man. It was big. Yeah. Then we couldn't get it. The airplanes couldn't get it because they would bring it back into the mountain. It would come out and then do their dirty work, and then it would go right back into the mountain. So we couldn't get it. But like I say, if, if we, if we instead of stopping what they should have done, we should have taken the high ground. Well, then after that, the, uh, the war was over in Italy. After, after, after the, the second time for me, it, it, uh, the war was over in about three weeks in, in Italy. That's when Mark Clark marched into Rome. Big mistake they made there. Big mistake. They should have never done it, even a German... Officer said it was a bad, why we ever, they ever did that, he never know, and he was a German officer. Big was lost a lot of men for now, oh God. It'll tell you how many we lost, unbelievable. It was terrible, it was terrible. Yeah, terrible, what are you gonna do? It's one of those things. But I don't regret it. I don't regret it, everybody tells me, they say, thank you for your service, you don't owe me nothing, which they don't. And I never talked about it, never. It didn't bother me to talk about it, it never bothered me. I just didn't talk. That's all, I didn't, just didn't talk. And I didn't know I had this uh, <coughs> symptom until my records were burned because my wife threw my uh, discharge away. She didn't know what it was. And it was burned in the Kansas that time and mine was one of the most burnt. So, so I didn't go to the hospital Oh, many years after, and that's when I found what I had, because never went on vacation, I didn't want to go. I have first cousins in Canada, I didn't go. My sister's 80th birthday, it was in California, I didn't go, but my brothers went, they went there, I didn't go to Fireford, I just couldn't stand it. Today, I still get a little thick, I hear car doors closing, even the phone ringing, and it, it was terrible. I didn't know what I had. Didn't know what I had, but that's it. Did you have nightmares, trouble sleeping? Oh yeah, I got when I was told, after I got married. When I was at home, I'd jump up in bed, and my wife would jump up. She said, "What's the matter? What's the matter?" I said, oh, "Nothing." I said, "I just had a nightmare." You know, it ended. It ended up then. I had to go sleep in one of the spare bedrooms. Because I didn't want to make her scared to wake wake up. And that's where I went. Went into the spare bedroom, closed the door, and didn't bother her whatsoever. But uh, like I say, I, this was terrible. Terrible. Should never happen. Not, not a, not, then I went, uh, I had, I went to Pompeii. You know, that's where they destroyed it. And the volcano went in the volcano. I thought it was going to erupt when we were there. But then we, we bivouacked out, outside in the field. It was child time. You'd see three or four little Italian kids. They'd come in. They were maybe 10, 11, 12 years old. Solid faces, skinny. They didn't, they stayed there. And then when the cooks, we got done feeding us, uh, they would give it to them kids. And they would take, and I cried. I just, couldn't stand to see them kids, you know. They went through hell, too, you know. And uh, they would take it home, you know, whatever they had left. And, uh, of course, there was another time. Am I talking too much? No, no, no. I... So then they called us when we was back from the rest area. They, they called us out. We're going to full pack. We're going to go. So, so we come out. Damn for them to start raining. So they said, well, you got to back, go back in and get a full pack, and we're going to march. This was at night. So we come to this mountain, and uh, he said, well, we're going to, it was raining. 
we had to go back in and put our ring here on. So we go to this uh, bottom of the mountain. They said, well, you're going to go to the top. We're going to camp, pitch our tents up top of the mountain. I go, oh boy, it's still raining. So we started part the way up and every so many hours they got 15 minute break. So I'm looking around and look behind me, there's the farmhouse, it was a little light. So I told a couple of guys, I said, hey, did you see it back there? They said, yeah, <laughs> that's a light. He said, so what? I said, I'm gonna go see what it is. And he says, uh, are you crazy? We're gonna be pulling out, they're gonna miss us. I said, I don't care. <coughs> so I got up, started towards the farmhouse and these two guys followed me. I knocked on the door and tell him, tell him fella, peeps out there, you know, he didn't know what the heck it was. I started to talk Italian, you know, telling him I had relatives of this certain town and this and that. And uh, I said, we're not here to do you any harm. He said, but I said, do you have anything to eat? And he says, uh, well, yeah, I says, I have some chestnuts and wine and bread. Do you mind if we come in? He says, no, come on. Because he was at ease then, you know, I spoke the language. And um, we, we goes in, and when he was going to get the stuff, I got the guys together. We got, we had uh, op op occupational money, you know. And uh, we both put it together, it was a nice pile of money there. When he come, I gave it to him, his eyeballs got that big, because it was a lot of money. Well, we couldn't spend it anyway, never went. So anyhow, we, we started to we drinking the wine and eating chestnuts and eat, eating bread, you know. And I told him, I says, it was still raining. I said, do you mind if we uh, stay here the night? We'll sleep on the floor. He says, no, no, okay, go ahead. So he went, did his whatever he had to do. This was at night and uh, we stayed at night. It was nice and warm. It, was, uh, it wasn't wet or anything. And in the morning, we hear some rattling down there and we see the trucks coming in to pick the guys up. So they said, okay, wise well, guys, tell me, what are we gonna do now? I said, I don't know, we'll see. <laughs> Goes down the mountain, who comes up to me? I say, the sergeant, where you guys been on? I said to him, where have we been? He's up on top of that mountain, cold and wet and everything. He said, get in the trucks, we're going back there. <laughs> so he got away. And, and when we got in the truck, we started laughing, you know. And for days and weeks after, every time we seen each other, we bust out laughing. We got away with something, you know, yeah. So that was pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> you also have another great story about meeting your relatives. Oh, yeah. Tell, can you tell that story, please? Oh, sure. Now, when I, first of all, the, the captain owed me a favor because I didn't smoke, but I did smoke a cigar now and then, Marsh Wheelings. They were the long, skinny ones. My mother, I said, sent me a box. Of a thing, and I said, I was close to the uh, where my mother, not real close, but I said, Well, the captain knows me. She used to come down, he says, Would you take hey, soldier? Would you sell me a cigar? I said, Yes, yeah, sell you a cigar. Yeah, I give him two or three, you know. Okay, and then he'd come back again, I give him another two cigars. So then, uh, first of all, then I asked him, I got relatives a certain time, I want some leave. He says, Well, I'll tell you what, he says, I can give you two days, that's because we're going to be moving out. In the meantime, I took a, was take a walk by myself on this road, which I shouldn't have done. Behind me, there was two young boys. I might have been in their 20s. I said, what the heck, they're following me. What the heck do they want here? <clears throat> so I turned around and again, I started talking Italian to them, told them I had relatives here and there. So they turned around and they went towards, went into the woods, gone, God knows what they would have done if I wasn't, you know. Then I caught a truck coming back, there was British soldiers. They took me back to camp, you know. <clears throat> well, anyhow, I got to be surprised, the trains are running, there are electric trains over there. Beautiful, green, not leather, there was uh, green cloths on top of them, and when they would pull out, you wouldn't even feel it, because they were electric, big uh, picture windows on there. So I go to this one town and my dad used to talk about all the time, Foggia. He used to go there with his little mule and sell figs and that, you know, when he was a kid. So I asked the guy, you know, where this town was. He said, oh yeah, he said, it's uh, so far away. He says, I said, well, where can I get the bus? He said, bus? He said, you kid? He said, all the bridges was out. You have to walk. And I started walking. So I meet this one fella 
And I asked him if he knew where this town was. He says, well, I'm not too familiar with this area here, but you see the little house down there? So I said, yeah. He said, go down there and ask him. So I goes down and knocks on the door. This little Italian fella comes out. He was my mother's brother. And I couldn't go in until I went in and had somebody. Then he took me up in the mountain and he introduced me to my dad's father, my dad's brother and his sister. And also two brothers and a sister of my mother's. So that, that would, that, but before that, when we was at the rest area, I went into the canteen there and uh, one of the soldiers come by, he said, hey, there's a little old man here asking if there's anybody here from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I said, yeah, yeah. So I went back and I started to talk to him. He was my mother's first cousin. And he had to take me to his house to phone the town that my mother and dad was born, tell them that I was here. And they said, oh, we want to see him. Tell him, come, come. And I said, well, I'll do what I can. But when I got there, I, I only could spend one day. I slept with my dad's brother, and his sister was there, made me homemade macaronis. And then I, I even met my godfather that baptized me in this country. He got, got me a gold watch, pocket watch. I still has it there. I give it to my son. And, uh, and I had to come back to camp. Then one more day, I had to walk to the town. My cousins showed me the shortcut. And that's the only to only spend an, a day, two days, and that's it. Because you just you couldn't do it. You had Shabbat, you know. But it was uh, quite an experience. It was good, and lots of cousins. Was that the only time you ever saw those family members? You never saw them again the rest of your life? Oh, no, no. I never saw them again. Now, my dad used to tell me stories. Of, because they, they were kids. They used to work in the fields from morning till night, 17, 18 hours a day. Now, when I, before I went into the service, I told my dad, <clears throat> his mother was still living. I missed my grandmother by six months. She had passed away. So I told my dad, I says, wouldn't you like to go back to Italy and visit your mother and dad? You know what he told me? There's nothing over there for me. And his mother was still living. But he, when he, I thought it was funny, you know. But then when the stories he told me how they had to work like horses, they were 11, 12 years old. And that's why he didn't want to go back. So that, so that was it. And when you came back on the ship, you were still in the Army. They kept you in, right? Oh, oh yeah. I got discharged to this guy. As a matter of fact, I was fortunate to be shipped out here, a camp at uh, South Park. I was there. Huh? So one, one time, I, it was close to home. I had to go into town, get a streetcar, and I'm out, I'm home. So I took off one time, would not leave, you know. When I come back, and, and Captain called me in, <clears throat> I was pretty good at uh, uh, giving close order drill. I was real good at it. <clears throat> That's a private. So he calls me in the office, he says, uh, I hear you was gone without leave. I said, yeah, I said, well, I was pretty close to home, yeah, I felt the going home, got a, you know. He says, you know, I had you put down for sergeant. He said, but you know, you're not going to get it now. So he gave me some three or four days you know, in a brick or whatever, and that, and that was it. Then they shipped me out of there down to Virginia, and uh, I got discharged from there when I was in Virginia. So that's where you were when the war ended? Yes. Yeah. That's when it ended. Uh, so I come home. But like I say, I would have, if this sergeant wouldn't have said nothing, I'd have went to the South Pacific. You really would have? Yeah. After all that it, you had been through, you would have gone. Well, that was crazy, I guess. I don't know. Young. Were you, I mean, why, why did you want to go to the South Pacific? I really don't know. I can't tell you. But I did. But then he told me, he says, you, you're on the point system. You're on he said, you're going to be getting out of here a couple of weeks. And uh, I said, well, what the hell? I might as well go. So no. After the war, did you ever do any reunions? Did you ever get together? No, but I got invitations to go because this outfit was was doing World War I, one of the good 
the 36th during World War I, one of the top uh, divisions, was only Texans in there when they first started, nobody else. Then when the war broke out, they integrated everybody at that. But so I got uh, the letters for reunions and that, but I just didn't feel like going. Just didn't feel like it. So that's it. That's it. Yeah. And wasn't weren't there hearings about the 36th Division and the Rapido River, that battle that you were in? Yeah. Uh, congressional hearings. They called General Mark Clark and another. Forget who the other one was to Washington to give them hell because that was a big blunder that they did. A lot of lives, young lives, died there, which should have never happened. It was a monstrosity. But the reason he did it, he wanted to be the first one to get into Rome. Now, that's why. But as a matter of fact, he was the first one. <clears throat> now, there was a, an English general. He was close to go, going into Rome, and Mark Clark told him, don't you dare enter Rome. If you do, I'm going to fire on you. He's going he's to hey, bomb the hell out of them. So he held back, and that's when Mark Clark wrote in. But he, he, what he did was a bad thing. He should have never had them. Two battles should have never happened. Too many lives were ruined and lost. Unbelievable. It was terrible, terrible. But what are you going to do? Them people suffered like us. Uh, but uh, nothing ever come back, come come out of it. You know how they do. They play games. You know. But uh, that's that, 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 that. That was it. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Al. Oh, this you're is welcome. Wonderful to get this recorded. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like I say, I haven't started to talk about my. What, what I did in this country till way back, I said, you were right when you said you should tell, you should tell the story. Because law, you'd be surprised many people want to. They want to know. They weren't even born yet, but they want to know what's going on. And has it been good for you to talk about it? I, it didn't bother me to talk about it. Really, it didn't. I just didn't talk about it. But if I talk about it, it didn't bother me at all. How about your brother? Did you ever talk to your brother about your war? Experience? We lived in the same house. And when we, he came back <coughs> from Germany, and I came in, we never spoke a word. And he was wounded twice at the Battle of the Bulge. Never spoke about it. Unusual, isn't it? Not that he, we didn't want to. I didn't. I don't know about him. But he never talked about it, and I never did. Yeah. But uh, the thing is, I regretted it because... When I was in the hospital, my brother was wounded, and my mother got a letter stating it twice, you know. And then I said to myself, now that uh, I'm here, they're gonna, my mother's going to get a letter saying that I'm in the hospital, I was wounded. And I said to myself, how much can a mother take? That's what I was worried more about her. She had four of us, four of us was in there. I had my younger brother was in the Navy peacetime. My oldest brother was in the army, but he was re, re, uh, he didn't pass it the first test, so they didn't take him. But then after the war, they, you know, they took him, and uh, so the four of us was in the in the service. And your poor mother! Oh, oh my God. gosh! You know, you have two wounded. You know, you what are they going to think? So, so that's what I was worried about her too. You know, I'm laying in the hospital too. And she's going to find out, you know, but... And your mother and dad never asked you about your experiences? No, never. Uh, like I say, I never talked about it, but it didn't bother me. If they did, it didn't bother me. I didn't, didn't whatsoever. But uh, I thank God that I come back in one piece. And a lot of them didn't. 